bands that many of you would know, but I won't run off any list right now. Uh, John also is a professor himself. He has taught entertainment law as an adjunct at the University of Alabama School of Law as well as Cumberland School of Law. And he speaks frequently on entertainment law and copyright topics at conferences, including South by Southwest, which is incredible for any of you interested in entertainment uh, issues, you should definitely make time to attend in March. And he also speaks at the Americana Music Association Conference, which is here in Nashville, uh, Future of Music Policy Summit, Next Big Nashville, Digital Music Summit, Cutting Edge Conference, Midwest Music Summit, so obviously he makes the rounds and is an expert. Uh, and even cooler, uh, prior to becoming an attorney, John was a professional musician and producer and engineer and was a member of the Atlantic recording artist, The Lemonheads, which if you're my age is super cool. <laughs> um, okay. You're aging yourself, Casey. I am aging myself. So much better than mine. <laughs> yeah, I should have let, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, and uh, J.D. Connell, uh, Connell is the Vice President and Council of New Media Licensing at CSAC, which is a performing rights organization. He is with the office here in Nashville. And JD is responsible for negotiating high value uh, licensing agreements with a special focus in the area of new media. Uh, he is really one of the of a handful of people uh, in the entire country with specific expertise in this area, so we are lucky to have him locally presenting today. He also works with CSAC <coughs> senior management in creating and implementing their licensing strategies overall. Um, JD received a Bachelor of Science degree from Union University before obtaining his JD from Mississippi School of Law, where he co-founded the uh, Sports and Entertainment Law. Uh, Ivy League. Both of those are Ivy League schools. There, yes, absolutely. In the South. And he's been with CSAC since In 2005. So welcome to both of you. And I'm going to turn it over first to John, who's going to be talking about uh, the uh, artist rights first, I believe. I'm, I'm going to be the first to drone on for 45 minutes, so yeah. uh, everybody get comfortable. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yes, yeah, she's, she's right. I have taught law school before, and I have given presentations, but it's been a while. And uh, I'm happy to have this opportunity because uh, I'm gonna, doing this again at South by Southwest in a couple months, and uh, I'm a little rusty, so I'm doing my best here. But um, when... <laughs> Is this a little loud? It seems, sounds like it's about to feed back. Maybe I'll just move the mic down. How about that? Is that better? I think this is better. It sounds better. Yes. All right. So when I did used to teach law school, um, I taught entertainment law classes. And I would usually give a kind of framework for the class that I taught and a theme, as it were. And the theme that I would give at the beginning of my class, and this is not, you know, I'm not saying this is true 100% of the time, but it's often true that entertainment law is influenced by changes in technology. So we have this disparate, you know, various areas of law that come together. You know, it's not just copyright, it's not just contract law, it's not just labor law or whatever. It's all these different areas that are, that are influenced and usually follow innovation. And when we're talking about, I'm talking, well, first of all, let me give a little bit more background. The way that we're organizing this, we're talking about basically digital performance rights. I'm talking basically about sound recordings, and then I'm gonna hand it over to my, to my good friend JD here, who's gonna talk about songs. And, you know, for anybody who hasn't studied entertainment law or copyright at all, you know, the sort of jumping off point is that when we're talking about copyright in the music industry, we're talking about two basic copyrights, the sound recording and the composition, the musical work. And so I'm talking about sound recordings. And sound recordings, are, I think, are a really good uh, uh, thing to talk about within that framework because you know, sound recordings, as, as you know, they're protected by copyright now only became protected by copyright fairly recently. The, the, <clears throat> the Sound Recordings Act was 1972, so why is that? Well, uh, prior to that, or much prior to that, it was very difficult, if not impossible, to make copies of sound recordings. And if you look at the very early contracts that, that transfer rights in sound recordings, it's about transferring the parts that you needed to manufacture records, you know, because it was very difficult to make copies. And, you know, over the course of the 1960s, with the advent of, of cassette tapes and, and, and uh, easier duplication, it became a, a, an issue for record companies that people could pirate or, or uh, bootleg 
records. So eventually it became necessary to protect sound recordings under copyright, but it was sort of a narrow protection and it did not grant a performance right. Now I'm gonna let JD give a little bit more background on performance rights in songs, but essentially there was no performance rights in sound recordings initially. And that changed in the mid 90s with the growth of digital technology and the rights holders became anxious because it was very easy to copy uh, sound recordings. And they felt it necessary to protect their interests to, to define some, at least some limited uh, right in, in digital performances. So in, in 1995, um, Congress passed the Digital Performance Right and Sound Recordings Act, which established this, this right. And it created a, a distinction between what you call interactive services and non-interactive services. And by the way, you guys should feel free to jump in at any time. Or if anybody has any questions, by the way, you don't need to be formal about it. If anything's unclear, just jump in. <clears throat> but uh, it was, you know, again, this is responding to changes in technology. And, and uh, this is the mid-90s, and most of you are probably quite young at that point, but the internet was very, very young. And it was unclear at that point, certainly what it was gonna look like in 10 or 20 years. So it was a blunt attempt. They created this right. Just to interrupt quickly, what, what were we talking about at the time? So, cause, you know, because right now I'm thinking of all these, you know, of interactive, non-interactive sites that I know of today. So at that time, what kind of digital I mean, what sites existed? About? Well, I think they could look ahead and see that digital streaming was possible. Yeah. And I don't think that MP3s were prevalent yet, but there were some compression technologies where... Uh, I'm not sure at the, in 1995 what would have been what would have been made available, but um, let's see. I mean, I, one thing I do want to point out is that the right is is even further limited. Not only is the, the sound recording public performance right limited to um, digital transmissions, it only applies to audio. So there's no public performance right associated with the sound recording embodied in an audiovisual um, work. Um, so that's why we have YouTube. So, uh, so probably both of our presentations um, I don't want to call it a presentation. Both of our discussion topics will revolve around digital audio services, and we probably won't touch as much, if at all, on Hulu or Netflix or YouTube, because... Yeah, we talk about that a little bit, but we're really talking about audio-only services here. And uh, so then, uh, several years later, uh, Congress enacted the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which further refined this distinction between interactive and non-interactive services. And the reason why this is, this is important to this discussion is because under this framework, the interactive services needed to negotiate a private contract to get uh, licensing rights from the rights holders, from the record companies, whereas there was a compulsory framework under Section 114 of the Copyright Act for those non-interactive services. So yeah, we probably should say, just in case, that's you know more specific to music industry folks, and you guys don't haven't heard the term. I mean, a compulsory license uh, just means that the rights holder doesn't have the ability to say no. There's a fixed rate, and as long as you pay that rate, then you are authorized to 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 make whatever the apl applicable exploitation is. Just to contrast this with the panel we just had in theater where that, that right doesn't exist, so uh, where you would have to individually license those. Right. those and, and the other thing that I need to point out at this point, and this is a very important uh, distinction, is Congress created this performance right for digital transmissions only. So there, there is no uh, right to a performance royalty or a license required for performance design recordings for terrestrial radio. And that's been a real hot button issue in recent years. And I was telling JD about this. Um, I used to, I, I spent a number of years practicing law in Birmingham, Alabama. That's, that's where I uh, started my practice. And I've, I've only been up here for just over a year. But when I worked in Birmingham, I was developing this artist practice. I represent mostly recording artists. But my firm was um, a sort of a media law firm. So they represented just about every media interest in, in the state of Alabama, including the Alabama Broadcasters Association. And they, you know, so 
this issue, the two sides of this issue, when you're talking about terrestrial radio performance royalties, on the one side you have the record companies and recording artists who really want it because you know, they have it everywhere else in the world. It's ridiculous, they say, that, that they don't have it in the States. And, you know, it, it, certainly in, in struggling times for sound recording revenue with declining sales, it would be really nice to get that money. And they're holding our money, right? That's right. And on the other side is the broadcasters who consider it a tax, and they consider it a, a, a terrible affront that anyone would even suggest such a thing. So, you know, I represent recording artists, but I also used to do a lot of work for broadcasters. So I couldn't really talk about the issue at all because, you know, my different clients were passionately on either side of the issue. But I went to this, as a delegate from my firm, I went to this Alabama Broadcasters Association uh, weekend retreat one time, and I kept getting cornered by these broadcasters saying, what are we gonna do about this tax? How are we gonna beat this tax? I'd be like, I don't know, we gotta really get in there. We gotta fight the good fight, you know? Okay. <laughs> I hope this doesn't get back to my clients. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the problem with the, the framework in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is that <clears throat> their definition of what was interactive and what was non-interactive is pretty vague. And I'll read some of the language. This is the language that's caused problems in interpretation that's been worked out in case law, which I'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so under this definition, interactive services are services that enable a member of the public to receive a transmission of a program specially created for the recipient or on request, a transmission of a particular sound recording, whether or not it's part of a program which is selected by or on behalf of the recipient. So the key words here uh, to, to focus on are specially created. And if you think about the services that are out there, there there's a, a range, so on the one and on the one end of the spectrum, you have uh, digital broadcasts of terrestrial radio that are completely non-interactive. You know, okay, so Lightning 100 has, has a digital uh, component. You can, you can go on the internet to Lightning 100 and you can click on their streaming link and listen to what's on the radio. Totally non-interactive, no question about it. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have something like Spotify where it's completely interactive. And I don't know how many of you use Spotify. I do. I love it. Um, and you know, you can make playlists. You can you can pick your favorite album and stream it all day long. That's an interactive service. But then in the kind of middle ground, in the murky middle ground, you have something like Pandora, which has an interactive component for sure. You know, who's your favorite artist? Oh, Bon Iver. Type it in. You know, it's going to start giving you a couple Bon Iver songs, and then you get a couple of Fleet Foxes songs. What, make, what makes you bring up Bon Iver at all? I, I thought that was surprising. I thought that was weird. So I was <laughs> <laughs> because Bon Iver is your favorite artist, that's why. I do like him. <laughs> I'm just stating a fact. Um, so anyway, then eventually down the line, you start getting, you know, your Josh Rouse or whatever, you know, this kind of farther, farther from... Uh, Alabama shakes. So. <laughs> yeah, I can't um, But you, you understand, everyone's used Pandora. It's got just 700 million users or whatever. It's, uh, you know, you, you create stations and you give it some kind of framework and then it plays music that's basically within that framework. But it's not interactive to the point where you can select a station. So how does a service like Pandora know the parameters it can work in? Well, um, the key case here that I think is, is, gonna, is gonna dovetail into what JD's gonna talk about in a minute is uh, the Second Circuit case from 2009, Arista Records v. Launch Media. So the issue here is that the record companies want a service like Pandora to have to actually negotiate a license. They don't want them to be able to operate in a compulsory framework because they can hold their feet to the fire and make them pay more money, right? So they challenged that, and the, the, the service launch media that was uh, at issue here didn't even exist when they, when they, when they published a decision. I and mean, when they decided the case, it was, already, it was already history. But, you know, these were issues they had to work out for the other services like Pandora. We really needed precedent here. So they gave us a little bit of a, you know, some guidelines about, about what does it mean to be specially created. And, you know, launch, you can just figure it was pretty much exactly like Pandora. So, you know, you create, they create customized playlists based on your tastes and you have the ability to rate songs and, you know, you can 
give it a low rating, I'll never play it again. And it gives you a customized playlist that basically Launch Media is creating with some guidelines. And <clears throat> the court held that that was not specially creating pl playlists because you didn't, you the user didn't have sufficient control to be able to really, you know, play exactly what you wanted. And therefore, and this is the critical part of the analysis, it wasn't harming the market. You weren't gonna, it wasn't gonna be a substitute for going out and buying the CD. And that's what the companies are concerned about. And that was really the, I mean, I think if you read the interact, interactive service definition, I mean, from my perspective, Pandora, it certainly falls. I mean, the playlists are all specifically created for whatever listener is requesting it. I mean, um, but it, the general overtone was really the core just, I feel like, almost abandoned. They, they, they hung their hat on some small two-worded nuance in the statue, but really they just went back and decided that this was not going to cannibalize record sales. So, Yeah, I think it was really kind of a smell test thing. Yeah. Like, is this... And, and I'll, you know, in any kind of analysis, with fair use analysis or any sort of copyright potential infringement analysis or anything, it always comes down to the question of economic harm. And you know, who's asserting the rights? Are they being harmed? And I think the Second Circuit decided here that there was, was not harm. And in fact, I think that probably Pandora is a driver of sales. And I, I have this interesting perspective because before I was a lawyer, I was a musician and I have several records that basically nobody in the world cares about, but I own them and they're up on the internet and they're on Spotify and iTunes and stuff. And as Pandora has been become more and more popular, I see that more and more people buy my music. And it's just, you know, I can see the checks getting bigger and I am doing absolutely nothing. This is the most I've done to promote my music in 10 years. <laughs> This right here. I, I agree yeah. completely. And, and I feel like I hear that a lot from artists saying that they like the idea of Pandora, that it, you know, suggesting new music, people are discovering music. On this decision, though, specifically, just to kind of give you know a, a bigger view for for folks not as familiar, do, you know, is, in the industry, do, is the feeling that this was decided correctly? It, it depends who you ask. The services would say absolutely, and the record companies would say hell no. You know, it's just. It's just one of those one of those things, but I, I I don't know that you know maybe I'm speaking too soon because I do think that radio has always been a driver for sales. I mean that's the whole radio industry's argument of why they there's no public performance right for sound recordings in the terrestrial broadcast. But but I mean I really think you can go to Pandora and sort of let the Pandora algorithm work for you, the genome project or whatever they call it, and and you're going to hear a lot of music can't go specifically request a song, so that's frustrating. You're gonna wanna own it if it's something you really like. And you're gonna hear a lot of music that you wouldn't hear skimming through the terrestrial radio station. So I mean, I think it, if anything, I don't know if it increases music sales in total, but it spreads it out more because people are hearing, listening to songs that are different from what they were, would be listening to, or a, a wider array of songs than what they would be listening to if they were dependent on terrestrial radio. Yeah, I represent artists and I don't ever hear anyone complaining about Pandora. Except that, you know, when Pandora is trying to get their, their rates lowered, <laughs> you know, then they complain a lot. Yeah. But not the existence of Pandora. Because I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the rate setting procedure and, and uh, the issues around that in a minute. But as a general matter, um, you know, I, I think that, that uh, most companies and artists would like to see the webcasting space grow considerably. You know, I think we all know that we're heading to a, a, a landscape where most people get their music digitally, whether by download or streaming, you know, we're almost there. And I personally feel that, you know, in 10 years, we're just going to take for granted that everybody streams music. That's how we get it, you know, be a few people who want to own a LP record or a CD, like when somebody wants to own a coffee table book, but it's not going to be the, the, the norm. I think it's going to be pretty much 100% digital streaming soon. And it just makes sense. I mean, I get almost 100% of my music from digital streaming, and I feel fine about that. And actually, I want to talk a little bit about... Oh. <laughs> it's Bon Iver. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> she knows who it is. Um, <clears throat> so... I want to talk a little bit about interactive services. Uh, 
specifically Spotify. Now, a little background here. So, okay, so we've been talking about the non-interactive services like Pandora, and I'm gonna come back to that, but about interactive services like Spotify, these are subject to negotiated licenses. So, uh, if you wanna launch one of those, what? What's somebody famous? <laughs> if, or mom. <laughs> if you wanna launch uh, a service like that, you have to actually go and get a license from uh, all the record companies to launch it. So that's exactly what Spotify did. They went and negotiated all these licenses, but they've been very quiet about it and they've been very uh, secretive about it. So, you know, when Spotify launched in the United States, uh, you know, a little over a year ago, um, we didn't really didn't, no, nobody knew how much they were gonna get paid. We didn't know how the, how the you know, the royalties were gonna be structured. It was just kind of a mystery. So around that time, I got together a panel of, of people I know who I consider experts, like Burtis Downs, who's the REM's manager and attorney, and uh, the guy that wrote the case book that I teach out of in my class, uh, Ed Pearson, who's a very smart guy in music publishing, and, and uh, this guy David Macias from here in town who runs a company called 30 Tigers, very smart guy. And we decided we were gonna look at these statements uh, that we we're getting for the artists that we work with and try to understand how the, how the the rates worked, you know, basically reverse engineer it, you know, go from the statements up. And uh, so that's what we did. And we did, we did a panel last, last spring. And we were all pretty encouraged by it, actually. You know, when we looked at it, we kind of ran models about how it's likely to grow. Uh, based on our clients who actually sell a lot of records, we saw that it wasn't really harming their, their digital sales, but it was bringing in additional revenue that we felt was going to grow. And, uh, you know, I think that artists and record companies are very fearful about these services because um, they feel that it's devaluing music. Uh, where, for example, you buy an album on iTunes, it's $9.99, right? If you buy a CD at, at Walmart, it might be $12.99 or something like that. And that's kind of an arbitrarily established value for recorded music, which is a copy. You know, certainly the value of the you know, the parts in a CD jewel case are not twelve ninety nine. so you're paying something for that intellectual property. And, you know, it's based on how the market's functioned for years, but, you know, going from that to a structure where you're getting paid, you know, a, a, a third of a penny per stream is, uh, you know, certainly upsetting on some base emotional level. But then you think about the volume of, you know, this, this incredible sort of, you know, surge of, of you know, fractions of pennies that actually amounts to, to, you know, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's, it's, it's encouraging. We're all a little fearful about it because we don't know what it's, exactly it's gonna look like. But, you know, based on the sort of models we ran, it looks pretty good. And, you know, the challenge is just, you know, making sure that the revenue structures, you know, compensate artists fairly and, and rights holders fairly. And, you know, figuring out ways to scale and get people to stop stealing music and start subscribing to these services, you know, which I think is going to come down to convincing people that it's, it's easier and more convenient and, you know, and, and a, you know, a better value to pay 5 or 10 or $20 a month for a service than it is to spend all your time trying to find torrents, you know. And, I mean, I think it's probably true. I, I, I've never been a guy that downloads music, so I don't know how much of your day it spends, it, it takes. It might be, might be 90 seconds to, you know, get the top 10 albums, but uh, it's some time, you know. And as soon as somebody comes up with a service that's appropriately social and everybody's on it and it's reliable and you can hear it in your car, I mean, you know, that, that's gonna be the moment I think it's gonna take off. But anyway, I'm, I'm encouraged about that. But I do want to talk a little bit about the rate setting for the non-interactive services, because this has been really controversial. And then I'll let somebody else talk. Um, so under the DMCA, the, the Copyright Royalty Board, the standard they use to set rates for non-interactive services is a willing buyer, willing seller standard, um, whereby they have to kind of create a f fictional environment that would be similar to the negotiation environment that would exist if, it, if the compulsory license were not in place. So in trying to do this, they've in, historically they've, they've tried to set, be, set benchmarks. And in the 2007 rate hearing, uh, where they established, it was very controversial, the rates they established, because it, it was a 
pretty substantial increase from the previous rates. The standard they used was based on the negotiations between record companies and some of the big interactive sites, services. So, you know, they came up with this rate by, you know, sort of creating this fiction of this, this uh, competitive landscape. And, um, you know, what they came up with, there's a tiered system that's uh, for, for, for non-commercial non stations, I guess it's $500 a year for just a, a flat uh, fee. And then for, for commercial services, it's, it, there's a, you know, sort of a, a base fee and then a, a yeah, per stream fee, and it's sort of $500. But, you know, Pandora claims that, <clears throat> you know, under the current uh, scheme, they're paying somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of their gross revenue to licensed masters. Right. And they pay, I think they pay 0. 0.0011. Yeah, and it's subject, play, to, subject to rise even, even yeah, more in coming right, years. Right. So, and what you have to remember about Pandora is it's different from uh, a radio station that broadcasts to many because it's an individual experience. You know, so you have lots of sort of granular, you know, one person listening to songs. And for each play to each individual, it's that, it's that penny rate. Yeah, and one thing to point out is Pandora initially was subject to a higher rate and then I think sound exchange somehow there's a, there was this new rate category called a, a pure play rate uh, calculation methodology or whatever and so if a company could pay a percentage of revenue based on 100 percent of its revenue which which gets rid of a lot of companies I mean Apple couldn't do it because they'd have to include revenue from downloads and all this other stuff. So it's really only applies to, st to people who all they do is transmit music. They're not trying to upsell anything else. They're not doing other activities but fall outside of the scope of the statutory license. Um, like Pandora is a perfect example. All they do is, is, is provide a radio service. If you can't pay under the pure play uh, methodology, which uh, is the point zero zero one one per play per listener, then it doubles. So while there's still, there might be a percentage of revenue aspect to the calculation, it's useless because nobody ever monetizes a play of music as much as you would have to to pay under revenue. Um, so pretty much everybody that's not eligible for pure play that's a, that's a webcaster, I think, pays that 0 .0022, which comes up, I mean, if Pandora's paying 60% of their revenue, not, not many people are going to be monetizing it that much better. So you got to think it's well north of 50%. Well, right, absolutely. And then contrast this with the way that satellite radio uh, uh, pays, pays for their compulsory master licenses, right. which, is, which is based, it's a percentage of their revenue, which is relatively low. It's 8% it's over the next five years is going to raise, rise to, to 11%. So, you know the the uh, the webcasters are, are are have been actively trying to get Congress to to restructure their rate uh, uh, calculations so that so that they're paying more like satellite radio. You know, so that that's somewhere more in the sort of ten percent of revenue range rather than fifty. And then simultaneously, uh, you know, Sound Exchange, which is the sort of quasi-governmental body that collects these performance monies is trying to push things in the other direction so that satellite radio would have to pay on the, the willing buyer, willing seller standard where they might pay 50% of revenue. And there have been two bills. Uh, I think one was actually uh, aided. I, I think they're both kind of dead in the water for now. We had the, the Internet Radio Fairness Act, which was Clear Channel and Pandora's bill. And that was the one trying to get the rate structure so that they would pay more like satellite radio. That caused an enormous amount of outrage in the musician community. And then Sound Exchange's uh, proposed legislation was the Interim First Act, which would have done the exact opposite. It would have taken satellite radio to the willing buyer, willing seller standard. And I don't know if anyone followed it. I, 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 Casey, I guess you do too. I, I, do, I do a fair amount of work for the, for the um, Future Music Coalition in Washington, D.C. And at their last policy summit, it was a huge topic of conversation. And um, there's this guy, David Lowry, who's a musician who teaches at the University of Georgia, who's been like a huge 
kind of very vocal proponent of, or, or I should say, uh, um, foe of the Internet Radio Fairness Act, and has done a lot of organizing musicians. And, and for me, you know, I represent musicians, so I, I, I'm, I def certainly take take a, 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 a position where I'm opposed to the Internet Radio Fairness Act. But on the other hand, I want to see competition in that space. I want to see more innovation in that space. And, and uh, uh, so, go ahead. I have a question, if I can interrupt. So this makes sense to me why we're fighting over, you know, what the satellite rates are going to be and what the online rates are going to be, because that's the future. Um, but there's still so much talk about the terrestrial radio, not yep. paying performers, and there's, you know, been proposed legislation, there's been a lot of talk of coming into line with the rest of the world and paying performers. Do you think that's even worth fighting over anymore if in you know, 10 years most of the music is you know, not trust based The money disparity is crazy. I mean, it, it's important to even point out back to the satellite radio kind of webcaster distinction that we're talking about pennies to $100 bills. I mean, Pandora generating whatever it is, $300 million a year, whatever they're at now, is just a drop in the bucket compared to Sirius XM. I mean, I can't remember their latest numbers, but it's, you know, really no comparison. I mean, ultimately, I mean, Pandora has better functionality. As long as royalty rates don't kill them, I would assume that they will either, Sirius XM will, will, will evolve or they'll die probably because uh, Pandora just offers the user more, you know. Um, but right now, I mean, the, 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 the revenue disparity between the two is enormous. But on terrestrial radio. And then, yeah, and then you step it up to terrestrial radio. I don't know what. Way bigger, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, but just kind of trying to argue against your yeah. in 10 years, you know, that that radio format won't matter. You know? I, I don't think that's true. I, I think terrestrial radio is going to be around for quite a while. It, and uh, it's, it's not really showing that. It's, it's slowing a little bit, but not that much. Yeah, I mean, well. Well, you know better than I do. Well, I mean, ASCAP and BMI took enormous hits in their terrestrial radio royalties. Uh, I don't know that that's as much of a function of, um, of of radio's decline as it was they had really sweet five-year deals before that were based on a fixed fee and uh, it, they, they kind of got course corrected um, but but I mean terrestrial radio is it's still around they, they you know a lot of Pandora and services like that haven't really found a way to do local right um, so I mean we you know we, we definitely want to secure favorable terms for where we see the future going, but I, I, I don't want to just forget about the, um, the terrestrial radio side, because right now, I mean, we're talking about a lot of money. And I think there'll be another push to pass a bill. Um, it just, it, it was sort of, uh, um, you know, lobbied into submission at some point. Right. You know, there's a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, very, very strong opinion on either, on either side. I mean, that, that was when I was down at that convention, and talking to those broadcasters, that was the heat of it, and they were really in a panic that it was going to get passed. And that was on, on the very sort of, uh, you know, local level, but there was a very organized, you know, National Broadcast Association that was fighting it very, very aggressively. Well, we did have a visit from Congressman Cooper today, and if what he said is true, it's not like nothing will pass ever again, so maybe, you know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we have nothing to worry about, but just kidding. I'm a little worried about that. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I, think, I think that's a good point to, to pass. Well, I don't know if I completed my thought about those, the proposed legislation. But, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, there's nothing I don't think before Congress right now, I think those bills are dead. But I think there will be some kind of compromise between those two. It's a brand new dynamic. The people that have to pay think they're paying too much, and the people that are getting paid think they're getting paid too little. It's and, pretty and I much do, I don't, you know, I, I don't think that, what Clear Channel and Pandora are doing is just, you know, is, is you know, virulently anti-artist as some artists want to want to paint. And I think they, you know, especially Pandora probably is fighting to become profitable. Right. And, you know, I think it probably is appropriate to have some some sort of recalculation. But, you know, I don't think it, it makes sense to, you know, to reduce the royalty quite that dramatically. Right. Right. Is that, I'm gonna, is that handing it so, over? Okay, me? so that was sound. So I just to bring it back to the uh, to the outline. I'm, Full circle. Uh, I'm uh, I'm sound recordings guy today. JD's composition. So that's that's uh, you know some some context and some issues in the sound recordings category. Now he's going to talk a little bit about uh, about uh, 
Socks. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try to go through my talking points fast so we can have some Q&A and some discussion. And plus, I just don't like to talk very long. Um, like, uh, like John said, I'm going to talk about digital audio services um, and musical composition rights. Um, my topic will fall a little bit outside of the scope of what John was talking about because um, there are uh, some digital audio services, some rights in musical compositions that are implicated by uh, digital audio services fall outside of the performance right. They, um, as I'll discuss in just a few minutes, uh, some, some types of transmissions or forms of distribution only involve the public performance right. and. Other forms of distribution only involve uh, the reproduction and distribution rights. Um, and uh, so John's was more focused on just the performance rights, so mine will step, a, step outside just a bit. So, um, so what I thought I'd talk about is first kind of identify the forms of music distribution that are common to digital audio services. Um, and feel free to ask me questions about that because I don't have the definitions in front of me. I thought about bringing them. Um, so I'm sure you can stump me somehow to, uh, because it's, you know, it's not completely clear and people that write the law aren't always IT people. So there's, there's, some, there's some gray area. Um, then I thought I'd talk just kind of generally about what musical composition rights we're talking about. Um, and then I thought I'd tell you about some rights disputes, kind of the background about some rights disputes that have occurred where we kind of, as an industry, or rights disputes that ultimately resulted in us kind of at least temporarily coming to an agreement or an understanding about what rights are implicated in which form of distribution. Um, and then I thought I would just kind of apply that knowledge to some of today's services and give you um, kind of a flavor of the associated economics from a publishing perspective. So I will first identify the different forms of distribution that are really common to these services. Um, so really we're talking about interactive streams and non-interactive streams. And um, that is determined in, a, in the musical composition world, that is determined in an identical manner to the way it's determined in the sound recording world. So uh, if it's an interactive transmission on the uh, sound recording side, it's an interactive transmission on the uh, on, the, on the musical composition side and, and vice versa. Um, the other two forms of distribution that are really common today in today's services are permanent downloads and limited downloads. Some of you guys are, you know, 23 years old and this is ridiculously elementary and redundant, but uh, those are the types of uh, forms of distribution that are really common to today's services. A permanent download is obviously your iTunes download. You bought it, you own it, you can do whatever you want with it, subject to whatever DRM might be embodied in the, in the file. But, and a limited download is more of a subscription product. Um, a limited download is, uh, is a download that's, that's, that's transmitted and, and stored on, on the computer's memory, but it's not uh, perpetually accessible. It, it either times out if you haven't paid your subscription fee or it times out after a certain period of time, but a limited download is just what, it, what, what the name implies. It's, it's, it's more limited than a permanent download. Um, so the rights implicated are uh, the right to perform the work publicly, uh, or better known as the performance right. Uh, the performance right is traditionally licensed by ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, the PROs. Um, I am CSAC's lawyer, um, so I'm pretty familiar with those deals. Um, one interesting note is, or, or maybe caveat to that statement, is that some of the major publishers have really made a big uh, uh, stir about pulling their digital rights, their digital public performance rights from ASCAP uh, and BMI, um, such that they can license the services directly. Uh, and I think a lot of the reason for that is that ASCAP and BMI are subject to consent decrees with the Department of Justice. Um, they were found to be in violation of the Sherman Act. Um, and actually, that's interesting. I don't know if they were f officially found to be in violation because the consent decrees are really agreements between the Department of Justice and these organizations, and they kind of govern the way they can operate. Um, and it's, you know, from my perspective, those, those consent decrees are, are crippling to a degree. It takes you out of free market negotiations and 
Um, you're always sort of negotiating with a, a gun to your head that you're going to somehow violate your consent decree or from CSAC's perspective that you're going to violate something that the DOJ feels like uh, is, is, is uh, or something that constitutes an anti-competitive act. Um, so you're always on, uh, you'll find the PRO's negotiations to be under much more scrutiny than, for example, a label's uh, negotiations or even a major publisher's. So which is, which is why, you know, Sony ATV at least has pulled these rights and I, I think that, uh, I think that other major publishers might um, because they feel like since they're not constrained by consent decrees, they can negotiate with these services directly and get more favorable royalties. And I hope they get more favorable royalties and then I'll use those royalties as a benchmark for my royalties and I'll get to increase. Um, so, so another function of the BMI and ASCAP consent decrees is basically, if I wanna start a service, I send a letter to ASCAP and BMI and say, hey, I'm requesting a license and I'm author, you know, my service is authorized. Um, if after a certain period of time, ASCAP and the music user, or BMI and the music user, whatever the case may be, are unable to reach an agreement on a fee, the, the, the matter is submitted to rate court, which is another function of the consent decrees. It's really the second uh, s s s Southern District of New York. Um, and uh, let's see, so the implication is that ASCAP and BMI can't really, you know, if a record label or a major publisher, if somebody starts using their music in a way that's not subject to compulsory license and the people don't pay and take a license, they file copyright infringement actions and the people wind up in court with substantial possibility of statutory damages and attorney's fees and so on and so forth. Well, ASCAP and BMI really don't get to file uh, copyright infringement claims. People send a letter, they start using the music, and then you go to rate court where they use this supposed uh, standard of a willing buyer and a willing seller in an arm's length transaction. Um, but sometimes the results seem like the standard is anything but. Um, they've really gotten beat up in the digital space lately. Um, so the other right uh, that is implicated in some of these forms of distribution is the, the right to reproduce and distribute uh, phono records to the public for private use, which is also called the mechanical right. So that right is subject to compulsory licensing, just like sound exchange on the sound recording side. Um, uh, the mechanical right in musical compositions is subject to statutory licensing under Section 115. Um, and most of the time, people, uh, people use Harry Fox as the clearinghouse for, for mechanical royalties. Harry Fox represents the vast number of publishers, so if you want to obtain a mechanical license from one of, their one of the publishers they represent, you, you just basically uh, go through Fox. Um, there are a bunch of independent publishers out there that's a real pain in the neck to track down to pay royalties, um, to ensure that you're not in an infringing situation. And there have been several businesses, one of which was started by a friend of mine that's just got bought by Google, um, that, that really just facilitate in maintaining data with respect to the location of publishers and the splits of the songs that they have. And they just basically take the money from the whatever service it may be, find the indie publisher and pay them and take a VIG. It's, it's nice. Um, so anyway, those are, those are the two kind of rights that we're talking about in general. Um, not all apply to every form of distribution, but those are the two rights that are really generally applicable to digital audio services. Um, some of the disputes that have occurred, um, first I'll talk about downloads. Um, when I first came into the music business, especially the digital side of things, this was sort of the hot button issue, especially since I was working at a, a public performance uh, rights organization. Um, so I think everybody generally agreed that a download represents the reproduction and distribution right in musical compositions. I'm not sure that everybody agreed that it was subject to a compulsory license, but I think everybody pretty much agreed that the reproduction and distribution right were implicated. Um, what wasn't so clear, we thought it was clear, but what wasn't so clear to everyone was whether the transmission of the download to the public was 
a public performance of the underlying musical work. We said it was, of course. Uh, the, the Digital Music Association said it was not. Um, ultimately, the dispute, and, and by the way, I mean, it brought commerce, it's just to give you a little insight on how this stuff works out when there's these rights disputes, it brought commerce to a standstill in the, in the, at ASCAP, BMI, and CSEC for a little while, I think, until we found some creative ways to reserve rights and not prejudice ourselves with respect to this issue. And we came up with some, some, some workarounds, uh, ways to sidestep the issue, and started getting deals done again. But it's a real pain in the neck when there's a, a big dispute like this. Um, so ultimately, this dispute found its way to rate court, ASCAP's rate court, uh, which is a, a product of the consent decree as we discussed, or as I discussed. Um, and uh, this 140-year-old judge, Judge Connor, God rest his soul, he's dead, found that, uh, <laughs> found that the, uh, a, a, a download, the transmission of a download does not constitute a public performance. He said, that, that contemporaneous perceptibility was the test, if I recall correctly. And you couldn't hear a download uh, during its transmission, or at least the form of downloads that were um, in existence at the time. And, uh, and, and as such, he said that they didn't implicate the public performance right. And as such, they were um, the only licenses for musical compositions that a downloader had to, had to pay were uh, reproduction distribution rights. Um, secondly, there were a couple of different disputes about um, streams. Um, I think. Before you move on, yep. is that a, is that issue put to rest, or are the do you, you know do you think that'll ever? Could, it got that affirmed. Happened? It got affirmed right. um, by the Second Circuit. I mean, in PRO, there could nine, be. So <laughs> I still reserve rights. I mean, it could be. It could be. There could be a circuit split. You know, I'm I'm never gonna just. I feel compelled by my fiduciary obligation to my writers to reserve rights on downloads, okay. but it, I don't know, I'll, I'll never say it's over, but, but <laughs> it, may, it may be, I mean, and the, the, the one thing I may bring, you know, might bring up is that there are, and this isn't really true in the audio world because it doesn't take very long to download in a complete song, but in the audio visual world, um, there are, are things called progressive downloads, which is really what you get when you download a movie from iTunes, such that it's not exactly contemporaneous, the exhibition of the content, but it's pretty close. So you're both exhibiting the content during the transmission, but then there's also a file created for subsequent use. And I definitely don't think that that's over. I mean, I, I would ha I have to always contend that that implicates public performance, right? Um, um, but anyway, so, so next there were a couple of disputes about, about streaming activity. So, so, so I think it was, you know, converse to the download situation, I think it was pretty much generally accepted that streaming activities implicate public performance rights, but publishers contended that they also implicated reproduction and distribution rights because you had to have a copy of the file in order to transmit the stream to the end user. Um, with certain types of streaming, there are cache copies made out, made all throughout the web world out there. Um, and they felt like that those, re those, those reproductions uh, and the distribution portion of it implicated uh, th those rights. Um, ultimately, I think, and this is, this is like, I've never even seen the paperwork for the settlement. Uh, I mean, some of it's obvious, but I mean, ultimately what happened was the publishers agreed that for non-interactive streaming, the music user did not need to get a reproduction license or that they wouldn't pursue the music user for reproduction licenses for the server copies. So, so the impact is for musical composition purposes, if I'm a non-interactive streaming service, all I have to do is go to the PROs. I don't have to go to the publishers and get any reproduction rights. Um, so it really simplifies the licensing process. So um, for on the converse of, 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 of that agreement, for not interactive streams, uh, the publishers and the, uh, and the Digital Music Association agreed that reproduction and distribution rights were implicated by virtue of the server copies and the cache copies and so on and so forth. Um, and they also further agreed that those 
reproduction and distribution rights would be licensed by way of a compulsory license. Um, and so, I mean, we just refer to it as a mechanical license in that context. <clears throat> so no, ser no server copy required for uh, non-interactive streaming <clears throat> and interactive streaming involves both mechanical rights and public performance rights. <clears throat> Let's see. The next, uh, the next streaming dispute that I, I, uh, I put on here were, was with respect to preview clips. So everybody's been to iTunes or Amazon and their download stores and previewed a song. Uh, iTunes, I think, I don't know the timing, a year ago or whatever it was, they extended their preview clips from 30 seconds to 90 seconds. Well, um, the, 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 the services contended that, that it was such a short portion, that the, the clip was such a short portion of the overall song, and it had a positive impact on the market for the sale of music, that actually these transmissions of preview clips constituted a fair use of copyright. So actually, I think the same 140-year-old judge decided, I think he was splitting the baby, and we really lost out on this one because we'd much rather have downloads, but I th maybe he was splitting the baby. I mean, plus he was just recognizing that they had a terrible argument. I mean, the, he, he decided uh, or found that at and this was in, by the way, this was also in rate court. Uh, this was AT&T Mobility's APSCAP rate court case, which I think Verizon also kind of piggybacked on. Um, but uh, old Judge Connor just found that preview clips uh, were not a fair use of copyright and are now, you know, and are subject to, to, to the usual licensing requirements. Um, so the last dispute that I'll talk about um, is the one I kind of know the least about. It's for locker services. So um, I guess you guys are pretty familiar with what a locker service is. I mean, it's 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 a service where the service provider stores content that the user either owns or somehow has possession of, and then transmit the con transmits the contact content back to the user remotely, but not until after the user has uploaded the content to their servers. Um, so so really, the first dispute about locker services was um, when Cablevision Cablevision had a new type of DVR program. So basically, Cablevision, instead of saving all of the programs that you set your DVR to record on your set-top box, Cablevision had a, you know, a server farm somewhere. And for every individual user, there was a specific storage space on Cablevision's server farm. I'm, I'm, um, server farm is probably not the right word, but what it sounds cool. Um, on, on, their, on their server farm, every user had their own individual space. So, I mean, if everybody recorded, you know, taxi one night, there'd be, a mi you know, 300 million copies of taxi, not just one. Um, so, I mean, basically, functionally, to the end user, experience-wise, it seemed pretty much the same. But for whatever reason, uh, Cablevision decided to do this uh, to make the save the materials remotely and 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 deliver it remotely to their users uh, through the set-top box. So Cartoon Network sued Cablevision for direct copyright infringement for reproduction and distribution rights implicated in the the saving of the program on the. Uh, uh, on the server farm, and, uh, and, and also for public performance uh, infringement because uh, in, in view of the transmission from the, from the server farm to the end user. Um, and the judge basically said, and I'm really, I hope this is right, and I hope you guys haven't read this case because <laughs> if it's not right, you won't know. It. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that for the reproduction distribution rights, the judge said that the, that, that, that Cartoon Networks had sued for direct infringement, and it was actually, the direct infringer was actually the end user and not Cablevision because it was the user's volitional actions that resulted in the um, reproduction of the uh, program. 
uh, on Cablevision's server. So I guess it kind of left open a kind of a secondary infringement claim. But since they pled direct infringement, uh, it was just a no, that's not direct infringement. The direct infringer in this instance is the user. And for public performance, the judge said that since Cablevision had an individual file for each and every user, and the user was just accessing the file that, that, that was in their dedicated space, that it, there wasn't a, a performance of copyright happening, but it was a private performance. So there's no, there's no licensing requirement for private performances. We're working on, we're working on that. Um, so then on, on later, later on down the road, there was uh, something that seemed even more sort of nefarious, this mp3tunes.com website, which was a locker service, and it also like, made it really easy for you to find illicit uh, mp3s on the web and populate your locker. And this one I know less about than Cartoon Networks, but the one thing that I recall about this case that seemed like we were headed down the slippery slope was the issue of, um, what do you call it? They had, they, they eliminated redundancy. So, so users still uploaded the content, but if there were redundant files on their servers, they would get rid of them and keep only one of the files so that if I'm a user and I've saved you know, a copy of Bon Iver, I, <laughs> I, I might not be accessing the exact file I uploaded because they've de, de, de duped it. You know, and so you know the copyright owners obviously said, "Well, look, you're deduping. This is a deviation from the way it was done in Cartoon Network's Cablevision decision. This is public performance." And the judge said, "No, that deduping is a very common um, IT function, and that deduping alone didn't uh, make the transmissions constitute public performance of musical works." And um, we lost again. So, so that's kind of. That's where, that's where that is. So, so like after I've given you that information or lack of information about the cloud stuff, but I gave you a little bit, the, the locker services, um, I just wanted to apply a little bit of it to today's services and give you a little bit of the associated economics. Um, I can't really break it down by PRO and I can't really give you specifics because I might get fired, but I'm gonna give you aggregate, approximate aggregate percentages. Um, so, so non-interactive streaming services, um, the examples I put down are Pandora, which is what everybody would put down. Um, they're the leader in this market. iHeartRadio, which involves both kind of a quasi-interactive function and then they also just aggregate sort of internet simulcast of terrestrial broadcasts for not only Clear Channel, but also who owns iHeartRadio, but, but also um, most other terrestrial radio stations in the market. And Live 365, which used to be bigger than it, than it is. It just, it was in my mind, so I wrote it down. Um, so really these guys, now these are not interactive services, so as I said, don't have to get a, as far as musical compositions go, now they have other licensing requirements for sound recordings or any other kind of, you know, advertisements or whatever they may uh, provide. But as far as musical composition licenses, they don't have to have a reproduction licenses for the, for the copies they have on their servers, um, pursuant to the agreement between the publishers and DEMA. Um, so all they pay is uh, public performance rights, and normally they get the rights from the PROs. And, and I'd say approximately they pay about 4% of gross revenue. Um, and I, I would- Stop with the 50%. It, yeah, and that's one of the things I kind of wanted to bring up and let you guys chime in a little bit is, I mean, so there's no doubt, like a label, you know, he's going to know a hell of a lot more about this than I will, but a label spends, I see numbers like a million dollars to break a band. They record the album, they give them pretty clothes, and, you know, all, all, every pay promoters and... Depends on the kind of label. Probably radio stations. Um, but they, they, they spend a lot of money to break bands. So it's understandable that there's some disparity between what the labels are getting paid and what the publishers are getting paid. You know, the publishers are really supplying the songs. I mean, there's some effort to get the songs cut, but they don't have the kind of upfront investment that a label does. But, so we're talking about 4% of gross relative to 50% of gross. 
So I mean, you know, it's more than was that more than twelve to one? I'm no, I'm not good at math, but I think that's more than twelve to one. Um, and you know, I just think there's a, a reasonable debate to be had about whether that's appropriate. You know, we we would like to see uh, see it closer to to parity and not by reducing the sound recording royalty. Um, but anyway, you guys aren't interested in discussing that. That's fine. Well, I'm wondering, do you think this is kind of part of a the uh, you know give back because they'll say well on terrestrial radio it's exactly the opposite you know the composers are getting all the money and we're not getting anything right and I still think that that's cr I mean think about terrestrial radio their total cost of goods sold is four percent of gross revenue I mean is that not I mean find me another business where your total cost of goods sold is four percent of your revenue and that's pretty good you know, because they're not paying the labels. I mean, I'm just saying for the music, all they're paying is four percent. It's pretty good. So I don't know. I think there's room for them to pay, but I don't want it to prejudice our musical composition licenses, of course. Tax. It's not a tax. <laughs> um, but anyway, I mean, I just think I just think that's a pretty big disparity. And uh, Dr. Gervais tells me that in in other countries, I haven't done a lot of independent research on this, but I have taken him out to lunch a couple of times and picked his brain, um, that, that, that other countries are, are, are in a, a position, or, or it's, it's closer to parity in those, in those countries, and, and, and I'm hoping that we'll start uh, headed that direction in, in the United States. I mean, I think that the consent decrees on ASCAP and BMI are are really starting to show when you when when the when the payments get more and more disparate um, there's something going on and you'll find that uh, I'm not going to get into it today but if you ever dig through the mechanical uh, the mechanical rates um, for for interactive services you'll find that the publishers in their negotiations have really tried to hitch their wagon to the labels because the labels get to negotiate in the free market um, so the minimums in many instances you'll find, and maybe all instances you'll find, to be a percentage of what the labels get, like 22% of what their recording, sound recording costs are, something like that. So I think that's a smart move. Ten minutes left, so do you want to hit the rates, and then I want to have an opportunity in case people have Yeah, questions. easy. Uh, so next thing is interact services involving interactive streams and con limited downloads. Uh, we talked about it. These are really Spotify, Rhapsody, Xbox Music, RDO. Um, these are really subscription services. There have been a few on-demand streaming services that are supposed to be ad-supported, but they've been <coughs> ab abysmal failures. Um, really the only model that seems to be making sense in this space, except for some kind of free trial, is a subscription model. These, pay, these people pay both PRO fees and mechanical fees. Uh, the, I'd say to the PROs in the aggregate, or for performance in the aggregate, they pay about 5.5% of gross revenue, so a little bit more than the non-interactive streaming services. And for mechanicals, they pay 10.5% of gross revenue, less what they pay the PROs in license fees, or what they pay for public performance license fees. But that result, the result of that calculation is subject to certain floors, which are often uh, a percentage of what the record company is getting paid. Um, digital music stores, um, you know, iTunes, Amazon, uh, you guys are all familiar with it. The mechanical rate is uh, uh, 9.1 cents, uh, except for with respect to long play rates, uh, songs that are longer than a certain amount of time. That doesn't happen much. Um, the Grateful Dead's not popular anymore. They don't, did, now, do they pay that straight to publishers? Or? Okay, so the iTunes and Amazon and your digital music stores pay via the labels, and your subscription services pay directly to publishers. Yep. Um, so that's an easy one. So for the previews, obviously the previews aren't subject to, to mechanical licensing, or maybe not so obviously. It's, a, it's an interactive stream, but they've carved it out specifically. Uh, they do pay the PROs or, or the publishers, whoever they want to engage in discussions for a license for the previews, but those are really the subject of, 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 of negotiation. Uh, finally, locker services. Um, pay. Uh, there's only recently been an established rate for royalty-bearing locker services. They pay 12% of applicable revenue. Um, there's 
a couple of types of locker services, paid lockers where it's like a subscription-based type of deal, or purchase content lockers where pretty much the locker is given to the user for free as long as the user buys content from whoever the locker provider is. Um, and what lockers pay for public performance, I have no idea. I'm trying to figure it out right now. We're uh, in discussion with those folks, but uh, we've just now gotten some of them to agree that they actually need to pay uh, some of them that fall outside of sort of their technological specifications fall outside of what cart, uh, cable vision and MP3 tunes were doing. Um, those people have, um, some of them have decided that they need to pay uh, for rights exploitations, but uh, that's sort of something we can talk about next year. Thank you. Well, I wanted to have an opportunity um, for some of you to chime in if you have questions of, of John or... Uh, you mean on possibly setting a precedent for terrestrial? I don't know. I think they both set bad precedents for their industry, but I'm sure it was best for what they did. You know, the Clear Channel set a precedent that people would get paid a percentage of terrestrial ad revenues, and um, Big Machine set a precedent of direct licensing around sound exchange, um, which will have its own uh, problems uh, down the road um, but but I'm sure I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that uh, the the I don't know I'm, I hope so I mean I, I'm I'm supposed to be ambivalent to that because we don't know how that's going to affect musical composition licenses are they going to come in and say look CSAC we were paying you ten dollars before but now we've got to pay the record label so we can only pay you eight um, you know we so I, it's hard for me to take a stance on it but but maybe Terrible answer. Sorry. Could have just shrugged. Yeah, I should have done like, like when I was in law school. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Gervais. Um, so, I, my, my question really is, is um, you were talking about people wanting to compete with It strikes me that the writers and the labels are in the uh, The writers uh, through the PRO. One, two, okay. Um, and so, so they're really in the position where, especially ask Captain BMI with the consent decrees, but I'm sure CSAC would be the same. And if they offer you to pay what you want them to pay, the company wants to compete with Spotify can. The record labels can say no to the competitor, right? They could say no, no, they just no. Uh, and my question is, is there a perception problem because the labels own 18% Spotify? So I, I hear this mentioned a lot about being a problem if you want to compete with Spotify, that the labels are in a conflict because they own Spotify, they want it to raise in value, uh, they own yeah. Why would they authorize a competitor? Is that a real issue? Well, they have to, I think. Is, I mean, I don't know. It just depends. It, there's a section, I think, in is it 114 or something that says if a label owns a piece of an interactive service and they grant rights to the interactive service, then they have to grant the rights on a no less favorable basis to other interactive services. But then, I mean, is does Spotify, I mean, does the labels do they own it? You know, you have the, your gray areas there, but but I think it's definitely an issue. I mean, I always hear about, you know, the big fear is that I'm going to spend a gazillion dollars with a startup music service, and I'm going to, uh, for whatever reason, whether it's because I can't promise the scale that another service can prom can promise, or uh, for whatever reason, that the, my royalty rate is going to be extremely higher than my competitors. And um, and and that's a that's a uh, you know that's a business killer. Well, it would take a, an amendment to the Copyright Act, but I personally and and by the way, I think I think we're due for a top-down uh, you know reworking of the Copyright Act because you know the Copyright Act that we're still under the 1976 Act is is basically pre-digital, you know, and it's a patchwork of amendments that you know that address all these issues, but. I personally think that 
it would be to the benefit of the industry if there were a compulsory license for interactive services because it would foster competition because the bar to entry to that space is so high. It's so expensive to launch a service like Spotify if it's appropriately licensed in America because you have to negotiate licenses. And, and you know, the other issue that we came across when we were doing the research for the South by Southwest panel last spring is that they don't pay everyone the same rates. These are negotiated rates for all rights holders. And, and the major labels get different, better rates than the indies. And this is something that some, like TuneCore is going to be very quiet about because they want people to use their service. But you get a benefit, if, even if you're a, you know, a member of ATOIM, the, the, the independent label uh, lobbying arm, or, or, or Merlin, you get a better rate. And uh, you know, if, if, if it were a compulsory, then you know, there'd be much more transparency. And I think that the service that, that wins, the service that really truly scales, and I think in order to truly scale, it has to be sort of 10 times what Spotify is now, has to be in. What is it? Well, I don't know they're worldwide, but it's like a million in the United yeah, States. Yeah, it's over a million now. It's decent. But, you know, Netflix yeah, that's, is 25 million. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, so it's, it's, a, it's a fraction. I mean, it would need to get, we figured out to get to, the, for the revenue to equal what the iTunes is now, it needs to be 8 or 10 million, something like that. Mm. So if there were not the same bar to entry, then there would be room for, for startups to offer a better service, a better product, a better, a better uh, uh, interface, and with the same uh, offerings, and there wouldn't be the holdouts. It wouldn't be uh, Spotify, but hey, if you're a Beatles fan, you're screwed. You know, that's, that's a big problem Yeah, for me as a Beatles yeah. fan. Yeah, <laughs> Patrick from the Black Keys is like a huge, you know, anti well, this whole thing service. is we don't understand it, you know, and it's like, well, I do, you know, let's talk. Yeah, I mean, I get, I get the. Have you heard about the? Have you heard? Have you heard people talking about doing like the windowing concept that people do with movies? Like, you know, you do, you release your new album on iTunes and physical, and then you wait six months to let the heavy rush go by, and then you go on the subscription services. There may be some merit to that. You think? No. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, it's. I get why they do it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I've not, you know, I haven't had it. I've have had, I have clients who have new releases people care about. I've never had one want to hold out. Yeah. But, you know, look at Mumford and Sons. You know, the, the, their their first week sales blew the doors up. Six hundred thousand U.S. sales first week. You have Mumford and remarkable. Sons. Remarkable. Do I work with them? Mm -hmm. No. That'd be awesome. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, but yeah. they they had something in the in somewhere in the neighborhood of what is eight or ten million streams, album streams on Spotify in the US. And that's massive. You know, and then and then what's what's that eight or ten million streams worth? It's worth, you know, tens of thousands. Eight thousand? I think you can kind of ball it used to be a penny per play per yeah. but now it's gone down, I think, to like it's there's a seventy five percent of a penny or something. Is that it's, right? The, yeah, the kind of the the for for subscribe well it's it look, I mean Different rates for subscription, for ad-based, you know, different rates for different rights holders. But kind of, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna approximate, it's kind of a, you know, third to a quarter of a penny per play. Yeah, that's what I was. A third of a penny, thirty-three percent. That's what I was down. Interesting. Well, I think we are at time. This is for the last panel of the day. I want to wrap on time, so I'm going to turn it back over to Shane and uh, thank our panel. Thank you.